While it might seem unintuitive for the government of Mexico to work with the people they're actively trying to destroy, the ones that they have been fighting for the last century or so, the problem is, for the last century, there's months and like thousands of people have died, there's months of violence, and there's been no clear solution that's come so far. The only way then that we can get rid of like either some cartels or to reduce the violence on some marginal level is to work with those individuals who are on the inside. What do I mean by this? I'm gonna do three things in this speech for you today. First, I'm gonna tell you what is the problem that we have to address here. Secondly, why should the Mexican government do this? And three, what unique benefits does this accrue that is not on their side? But first, on the model. We think that on face, the motion gives us plausible measures that the government will take, such as either helping them attack and engage with other cartels, decreasing pressures, on a on the cartel. We think the cartel chosen can be up to the Mexican government. I'm not aware of anything specific. Or it can just be the strongest cartel at the time. Whatever their choice is, we're okay with it. The end goal here is we have to understand that we need to reduce the sheer amount of violence that is persisting in this country and the mass displacement of individuals who feel like they can't even be protected and safe in their own home because they're locked into inter-gang violence. I'll get into later. So okay. one person. Sure. Just quickly, would this mean that a single cartel is granted a monopoly over the entire country, or that region by region different cartels would be prioritized? No, it's a single cartel, that's in the motion. So it's like they can take over as much of the drug trade as they want, right? Like single monopoly, exactly. So what then is the problem? The largest part of the problem right now that happens as a result of the cartels is firstly collateral damage. That means cartels do not just affect those on the instrument. It's not just simply about trading drugs up across the country and into the United States. The fact that they also fight over territorial disputes where they actively shoot and damage other members of society. The problem here is that thousands of Mexicans or innocent civilians die to these territorial disputes and other gang-related violences that flare up in our region. The unique problem here is that they have no way to actually get out of it, which leads to the second thing, where the, the only thing they can really do is to leave their home and like forever be gone from a region that they call a unique like they call their home set, the place that they grew up in, where they're either forced to leave the country or forced to like just hopefully not die on the streets on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not about like the nice, fancy uh, locations in Mexico, like Cancun. It's about the nitty-gritty, like down in the peninsula, where people and the drug cartels are so pervasive that the government itself doesn't even want to go in. Secondly, the problem is a lack of help. The Mexican government has no one to turn to. There's no help that comes either from their stronger borders, such as the U.S. and Canada, or from below where drugs are trafficked through. That means there have been, even if they have given aid in the past, it's still not been enough to ever stop the drug trade in and of itself, or to stop these cartels from moving. That brings me to my third point. The problem on their side is that, and our thing, is that the drug trade will always exist so long as they're a market. Two reasons why. One, it's ridiculously profitable to do this. If people feel like there's a lack of like necessity of jobs or stuff, it's just much easier to traffic drugs because people typically in America just really love cocaine and like will want to always consume these drugs in and of themselves. That means so long as there's always going to be a drug trade, 
the Mexican government has to do something to at least mitigate some of the harms that's happening to its constituents, to mitigate the harms that come as a result of multiple cartels existing. Secondly, then, what should the Mexican government actually do? This is first to talk about the uniqueness of cartels that is present within the Mexican country. Firstly, we have to look at why do people join. The thing is, cartels within a region are typically the most prominent force of inheritance. That means when you grow up in a society where the Mexican police are actively bullied out of society, and you feel like you can't have the agency to either get a job or stuff like that, oftentimes people do turn to cartels, or it's indoctrinated either by other family members existing and stuff, and like either family members and clearly on a territorial basis. Because you want to protect what little trade does come through your area because that's your only main source of income. That means they're always incentivized to join these cartels and then always fight the other cartels because that's what's going to happen. Like that's how they always clear about their territory. That means the inner fighting then is a second characteristic because it's purely based on regional location. Because the impact of this is that they're unlikely to come together and work because they're so ingrained in these ideas. Sure. Do you want that one day cartels just the power of cartels diminishes in Mexico means that the current day the structures are that the old core of like the drug production moves to other Latin American countries or Mexico. Well, I don't see why that's the case. You give me a lot more reasons to why I will just move. Because Mexico is a unique region that's a nexus between South America to the United States, where a majority of people do buy drugs within these regions. They're always going to use Mexico. Therefore, it's always going to exist. Secondly, then, as to why the government should do this, is because of individual cartels create, but yeah, already the territorial disputes I've talked about. That means, lastly then, this is the only solution. Because the thing you have to understand here is that sure, it's probably in their best interest to get rid of all cartels, but given the immediacy of the fact that territorial disputes are killing thousands of Mexicans, a forceful response is the only thing that can objectively do this. Why then should they work with, with one cartel specifically? Firstly, we give you the idea about access to information. See, the problem is, a lot of the times, drug routes, trade routes, and the inner workings of the cartel are not known to the Mexican government. They have no incentive to give this. Uh, to give this. However, when you're decreasing the effect that the government, or the pressure that government put on single cartels, you're more likely to work with them. That means you can look up things, like, like having access to like who is actually in charge, where does actually the drug force exist, like maybe the corruption within the area, and how the cartels actually operate. That's just pure information that cannot come from any other source because it's only coming from the inside. Secondly, it's a reduction purely of cartel numbers because if the violence itself is bred by the fact that cartels pop up and purely based on regional disputes, then one cartel by nature means that everyone's working under the same system. It means the lack of territorial disputes, the lack of regional fracturing gives the idea that one cartel will always lose the violence. Thirdly, then, the relationship also for future deals, because if the government itself is not working with one cartel, there's no reason to believe that they cannot either work out a future deal about where and how the cartels operate, or where and how like their power and influence can be exerted, or how on earth they interact with the police. Those are things that always come as a result of building and bridging a relationship between the second most powerful presence within their country outside of the Mexican government. Fourthly, then, we think that it's still going to be a, a, a reduction in the harms of the cartels in and of themselves. That means the violence in and of itself and the reduction of the mass migration of individuals who feel like they are locked out of their own homes, on the whole, will be reduced, on, like, will be reduced overall. When this is the case, and the Mexican government has no other resources, then the only way they can turn to is the internal structures within their own society. Given that the strongest power source outside of the Mexican government is the cartels and they control the majority of the region, working with the strongest one is the only solution to reducing the violence overall. I think the Prime Minister of Baltimore will interrupt the session to start off today for side off. the warranty of why the status quo is so bad. We would say that the status quo is a world in which we are pushing against the mechanisms that allow for cartel to exert 
exert tremendous power over the Mexican people. We would say that looks like things like border checks exist in the status quo, in which the Trump administration, even if they're not through the wall stuff, is investing aggressively in the types of surveillance policies that allow for drug routes to be pushed out. This looks like things like monetary checks so that you're not able to get as much money into a specific cartel, which means it's harder for them to do actual business. But thirdly, it looks like liberalizing drug policies in the status quo, which means that you decriminalize the types of drugs that allow for people to never come forward about why the cartels are so bad. We would say that these are all clear mechanisms that we defend out of OO. But secondarily, let's get into their line by line, and then I'm going to talk about why monopolies are terrible, and thirdly, why the U.S. will never accept that and why that's bad. So the first thing they say is there's no clear solution. Okay, great, you make the world worse, and if we win, this is true, we probably obviously outweigh it. The first thing they say then is that the end goal should be reduction of violence. I think the end goal should be a society in which the Mexican people would actually want to live in. They saw none of the crises that they're talking about, about human trafficking, about like people moving area to area, because there are simply always going to be Mexican people who do not want to take the war, do not want to live under the cartel, and that will always instigate paying violence. The way in which they think violence function makes absolutely no sense. They're like, ah, the cartels are existing, and there are lots of them, and they fight over them. But if you're a Mexican citizen, and you oppose the cartels, you're still going to be killed on their side of the house, and the state will sanction that killing, which means they always get more deaths on their side of the house. The next thing they say, there's no way to get out of it, and there's always lacks black and help. You make that worse because the people will never look to their government for actually getting any help from them, so you're always going to make this worse. Then they say there's an if you have an incentive to join cartels, and we could be sure, if we make the state better, we will, and this is true. And finally, actual mechanisms for solving this. The first thing they say is information. Information exists on both sides of the If you arrest someone, you can feed them out and get better plea deals to ensure they get some information, which is completely marginal. The next thing they say is that cartel numbers will go down. This again makes no sense. Because if you're just backing one cartel and you weren't, if you buy their best case scenario, able to solve for their cartel violence in the last three or four decades, how does I mean, ignoring one cartel mean the other cartel still does not exist and get more empowered? OG needs to get more mechanisms in place as to why the number of people who are participating in both cartels go down for one cartel, simply because the state buys or it incentivizes one person to be there. First thing I'm going to talk about is what the state is obligated to do. I think the state is obligated to do two. Firstly, grant democracy and democracy, but secondarily, to oppose the types of anti democratic tendencies of organizations. We would say the types of corruptions that cartels incentivize on their side of the house are terrible. It means that you can't have a public official, or you don't get any democratic responsibilities for things like basic roads or travel or goods that go to your specific city or education or all these things. This is how all encompassing cartels are in Mexico. And at the point in which they support that and sanction that by giving one organization that is not democratically accountable, so much power that is bad. But also, just think of their model. It's literally just an entire government that is completely undemocratically elected. That means the people who are in charge are never the people who are representative of their citizens. We think this is terrible for them and it's something that is bad. The second thing then is why are monopolies bad? I, why is the mechanism always lead to pragmatic problems? We would say that violence functions at the point in which not just like the negative externalities of violence, but the actual deaths that occur in uh, because of how the cartels function. This, it looks like things like cartels killing people off to make examples of people in cities and states and saying you should not oppose people. But secondarily, this looks like the, just the cost of accidental drug overdoses that occur all over Mexico, or human trafficking, which people are sold into slavery, which means that it's always more likely that people will live worse lives on their side of the house. But thirdly, it's not just about the people who die in cartel-to-cartel -cartel violence. That is, in their best case scenario, there will still be transitionary periods, which will lead to massive amounts of violence when one cartel, like one leader of a cartel, goes under or dies. We think that those political concerns only get heightened on their side of the house when the cartel has so much power. That is, they, when they create a monopoly, they create a power vacuum that occurs every time one cartel, one leader of a cartel, goes under. Thus, more people are always going to die on their side of the house. We would also say that drug cartels are incentivized to have fewer deaths on our side of us. Why is this the case? When one cartel always has a viable legitimacy or relative legitimacy with the government, they're always incentivized to decrease the amount of violence that occurs within their state. That is, if you oversee a certain, a certain area, in order to actually make the public be on your side, you're more likely to like a sewage or maybe or not like 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 kill people systematically because they, they can always turn to another cartel. This doesn't happen on their side of the house when the government has already sanctioned the cartel's existence, which means they're always going to get more violence on their side of the house. But thirdly, we would say at the point in which the cartels have an incentive on our side of the house, 
to look better towards the international suppliers of their drugs, they're always going to get fewer deaths. It looks really bad if you're a cartel, they're trying to get drugs into the U.S. border, if like your suppliers in Venezuela have to account for the fact that you're always killing people, and you're always being clamped down upon super, super hard. That means on their side of the house, they have never had an incentive to behave less violently than what they're talking about. Sure. So your model forecloses this possibility at the point in which if you give one person a monopoly over the market and they're like, ah, oh, we'll just start going on killing them, okay, just, what are you going to do? Are you going like, to like shift to a new monopoly? Like, I just think that they need to deal with the fact that endemic corruption is not solved for by giving the corrupt organization unilateral control over how politics and government bureaucracy functions. Second thing, the U.S. gets mad. Why is this true? Firstly, in the status quo, the U.S.'s goal is to decrease the amount of drugs that are filling in within their country. Trump's policies are explicitly nationalistic and portray other countries as being drug-laden health. We would say this is something that is bad and gets worse on their side of and the domestic politics are incentivized because of things like the opioid deaths that are being more publicized in the status quo. This means two things happen. Firstly, Mexico is a state sponsor of terrorists on their side now, at the point in which drug cartels are being labeled as terrorists within the, by, by the U.S. government. But secondarily, it means the type of enforcement mechanisms that actually alleviate suffering, i.e. border controls and surveillance measures, and billions of dollars in governmental aid and military aid do not go into the Mexican border. Just need to wait the probability of Trump or the next president being like Mexico, who are doing absolutely nothing to do this problem, and cutting border aid. This is something that is firstly an intrinsic good for lowering the actual number of people who die, i.e. if there is a U.S. governmental official or a military official on the border, they're more likely to prevent, to prevent deaths of border trials. But secondarily, some that access is the largest internally to alleviating suffering. The way in which they weigh is people join cartels because they are down in the ruts. But we're telling you the reason they join cartels is because there's no economic or political or governmental sanction, or governmental uh, mechanisms for them to get them a better quality of life. We decrease us on our side of the house for all these using for travel to I think the leader of opposition calls on the deputy prime minister to continue the debate for her side.
Here's the thing. The reality is cartels are really intelligent and really smart operating organizations. Like they have literal businesses that have protected themselves for decades. They are able to succeed and go through like the police forces and over the government's head because they are intelligent and, and know how to operate. I don't think that backpacks should be able to come up here and say things like, oh, this is exactly why we shouldn't trust them. I'm telling you that like we have an incentive structure for them to cooperate with us because we think that there's pressure in that relationship to continue doing good stuff. Okay, so like going into the deal, like um, we want a world that's best for the next few people as well, like opposition is like trying to do. Right? This idea that like cards have like this idea that like cards have always hit for people and they want to see trafficking, right? We're not saying that the motion says part of the mechanism to like employ this motion is saying we're allowing ourselves to kill people who we traffic. We're still going to try to police that and try to like actually get crap down this. The difference is, is now it's like the devil you know versus the devil you don't, right? Like we're now like having a relationship with these people inside our information. We're able to probably crack down harder and better on the crimes that aren't listed in the motion, right? We also think the second thing to say is like people won't look to the government for help now like there's not going to be any trust with the government. But we think like they don't currently now, but if the Mexican government frankly says we're doing our best to like find a way to help you or like so decreases the lower effects, they think that probably increases the trust between the people and the government. Then they like talk about the mechanism for quality that we need to show you, which I'm gonna go into um, currently. Okay. So the incentive structure here is specifically stated in the motion, right? So the key component that's missing from government's efforts is like access to insider information and corruption in those that are they use to police, right? Because like the police force has corruption, so like the people that are supposed to enforce it. Right? We say that like these groups um, have leverage and no reason to give into government pressure currently, right? Because they have the power and the influence, they have no reason to like submit to government like uh, current intents, right? Why do we specifically change? Specifically, this motion creates like um, incentive structures for cartels to cooperate with the government because we're not just saying like um, like you better do what we say because we're going to come down in front of you. We're saying we'll relax our efforts. We'll actually give you some legitimate control here as long as you help us in the like in the long run. We think these are incentive structures that probably mean that it's been less of like a lot of less money, a lot of less actual like power, and they get to do things that they already want to do. They have a huge like incentive to get rid of other cartels. Cartel and in violence is such a big thing. Like this is exactly what they want. So they have the government backing them up. This is the perfect incentive to get them to cooperate with us. We specifically think though this can only exist when we relax over the government crackdown or when we give them that that like legitimate power. So why specifically the benefits? We'll still cover the motions and like specifically talk about why the benefits be beneficial. Stopping military employment to areas of control. Like we already tell you the part of the spillover effects and the harms of like cartels existing is like territorial disputes and like fighting between cartels is what can harm the, the Mexican people the most. So we tell you like as like a, a and human trafficking can also be as like a point of like trying to pressure other cartels into getting information or giving up their own weakness. We think like when you like allow like this one cartel to have control of the places that they like already have like territory over, and we allow, and they we ask them to like try and take down other cartels, we reduce the ability or we reduce the um, uh, ability or uh, chances of territorial disputes to ever occur, or we reduce the ability of like cartel violence to occur because we're constantly trying to like use these mechanisms to get rid of other cartels in the first place. We tell you like this is how one of the ways that we achieve our benefits through benefits and through the mechanisms that stated in the motion. Then we have a next idea of like renouncing the head of headhunting of leaders. We think like once again it's like the devil you know versus the devil you don't. Because the thing about cartels that actually makes them such a great organization is when you cut the head of the snake, two more grow back, right? We think like the thing about cartels is like they're constantly changing out the leaders and like the uh, leadership and things like that. In our motion, in our side, we actually have a consistent regime that we're able to work with and like and cooperate with and negotiate and know the ins and outs of like how they operate and like what their like, reactions to certain things are. I think this is most beneficial in, in achieving that access to insider information and knowing that like the whereabouts or, or like how this is going to work. We also think the way that we achieve our benefits is like we're trying to like get rid of other cartels. So how do we achieve that um, benefit? Before I go on, I will talk about that. So on your side of the house, when our cartel knows it has a monopoly on the force, they're allowed to kill the other cartel and systematically kill them because they know the government will not stop. Doesn't that mean more people die on the side of the house? That's not what the motion says. The motion says we're allowing them to be arrested, arresting other cartels, and allowing like more information to like be passed over, right? Like the like it literally says target enemy cartels in a reduced number. We think that this like potentially could be like lead to violence with, within cartels. We think that like the more like ideal thing is like giving information to the government to let them handle it. Once again, that's less money, less power that they have to exert and they can focus on their own internal things. Okay, talking about like how this how do we try how do we actually rid other cartels better and like reduce the number of cartels by like reducing the number of like, deaths. But the Mexican people, this is like the best thing I think. 
we think that like, there's less spillover of the territories that you're going to talk about, but also I think we exert pressure on other cartels just from the image of having this one main cartel having the entire backing of the Mexican government. I mean, that's a very extreme, like, important thing because you're now giving the ability to, like, other cartels to, like, uh, give information. That's what it's like, there's a pressure to preserve this relationship. They're getting so many benefits out of this, they're probably not going to want to, like, start killing anybody or continuing human trafficking because it's going to piss off the government. Because this, this pressure to preserve that relationship is good to keep them in check. But I'm saying you just get information from the source, and this is just a better overall um, incentive structure to get life change. Thank you. The problem with the government of is that they've been remarkably uncharitable to the kinds of ways that in the status quo Mexico combats the drug war and eliminates violence, but secondarily they're remarkably uncomparative and they do not diagnose the real root causes of violence that come from the drug war. First thing, what are the mechanisms that exist in the status quo to mitigate violence? We say that the status quo of Mexico works with, the, with like the United States to combat the ways that drugs flow into the U.S., for example, or secondarily to secure things like intelligence sharing, for example, that then allow them to systematically undercut violence. So this they say, oh well, if you stop drugs from flowing into the United States, it doesn't actually mitigate the root cause of violence. The problem is that drug cartels are a business, and businesses rely on profitability. If businesses cannot get drugs into the United States, that means that the cartels are undermined because they have those resources. They then systematically hire people and provide better economic opportunities over the alternatives. That's how they have the ability to carry out violence in Mexico in the status quo. But secondarily, they don't talk about all the other mechanisms that exist, like intelligence sharing with the United States and the Five Eyes partners that allow us to then go and again counter drug violence. The comparative here is really simple. Who do you want to get your intelligence from? The United States of America or a drug cartel that once granted a monopoly will abuse that monopoly over time and become less accountable to the state over time. This is a comparative that the CGPOI also does not deal with. Really quickly, on that POI. They say that if you do have this monopoly in place, these governments are still going to be able to hold the monopoly cartel accountable because they know that they only derive their power from the state sanction. The problem is that they don't understand how monopolies grow and become more entrenched over time. If it is the case that the state is systematically only going after the alternative cartels, like cartel number two, three, and four, this means that cartel number one, A, recognizes that the state isn't going to enforce the law against them. That means they can get away with the things Drew told you in the POI they're going to do, like killing off members of two, three, and four. But second, over time, as that cartel, per the model that was given to you in OG, becomes literally the monopoly of the entire country of Mexico, this means they become entrenched in the local population. They become entrenched with the local governments, bribing their officials, and essentially becoming part of the local governments. Over time, they can gain national political power as well. Once you reach the point where literally entire swaths of the economy are dependent on this one organization, it's very hard for the national government of Mexico to turn around and say, if you don't behave well, we're just going to replace you with some other monopoly cartel that comes out of absolutely nowhere. They can't do that anymore. So once the monopoly is entrenched, they are unaccountable to the population. It functions as a de facto subsidy and guarantee of support, which then emboldens that one monopoly cartel to be more aggressive and more violent. Remember, the thing that matters in this round is not reducing the total number of cartels, it's reducing total violence created by the cartels. If we can prove to you that the one cartel that's left over is more violent than the sum total of the other cartels, we still win. On that, let's move to a discussion of why does cartel violence actually happen? The characterization given to you by the government Mentions as follows is that most violence happens when cartels fight one another. That is not the case. Most cartels don't actually engage with one another that much because they have their own business pathways. They have regional organizations and they get regional control from one to another. Most of the violence happens between cartels and other actors. For example, it's cartels fighting with the United States. It's cartels fighting on the border with cartels from other countries. They do nothing to solve for those sources of violence if you're fighting with a country that's neighboring Mexico, especially when all the cartels two, three, and four are probably moving to those neighboring countries as CO probably try to tell you. It also happens when they're killing off their business partners or engaging in human trafficking. These are all sources of violence that they're doing absolutely nothing to solve for. These sources of violence are only going to get worse when the monopoly cartel is now more emboldened to engage in these types of violence. Why are they more emboldened? 
Right now, cartels recognize that the more violence there is, the less, the more crackdown there is going to be from the state, and the more opposition they are going to face. As a consequence, their business partners, for example, are more chilled from doing business with them because they recognize that there is a risk to their business. Additionally, it is harder, for example, for them to recruit members into their cartel, recognizing that those members are more putting their lives at risk, for example. These are all business risks that have to be factored in at the cartel level, which then incentivizes each individual cartel probably to mitigate violence. On their side, the house when there is one cartel that is granted this de facto state monopoly, that means they know that even if there is violence, and even if there are human costs, even if there is human trafficking, there is never going to be a consequence to their actions. Therefore, the remaining monopoly cartel is now more emboldened. What does this look like? Firstly, it looks like the monopoly cartel engaging in just more violence and border clashes with cartels from other countries. Secondly, it means that again they're able to recruit more members because those members joining the monopoly cartel now know that they are going to be protected. Thirdly, it means that the state now has less legitimacy to offer alternatives to that monopoly cartel actually being in power. Again, the cartel becomes a greater feature of public life on their side of the house when they are literally ingrained as a function of the state. They are now a provider of economic opportunity, a provider of political power, and basically the state has no mechanism to say what you're doing is wrong. What this means at the end of the day is that the single cartel that's left over on their side is simply going to be worse. So all the impacts that they try to solve for, like violence, are also going to be worse. The next thing I want to talk about, though, is U.S.-Mexico cooperation, because this is something that is completely undercovered by opening government. What we say is that the U.S. policy has absolutely nothing to do with violence in Mexico. The U.S. only cares about one thing, which is stopping drugs from getting from Mexico to the U.S. Therefore, the U.S. is always going to have a take-no-prisoners policy when it comes to drug cartels. They are not going to tolerate the policy that Mexico is trying to advance under opening government. What does this mean? The U.S., one, is less likely to work with Mexico on drug cooperation, knowing that the Mexican government is in cahoots with one all-encompassing cartel. This is really important because a lot of the mechanisms that exist to check violence from the status quo, like the provision of aid, which can then provide better alternative opportunities for people who would otherwise join cartels, or the restriction of people selling drugs across the border, or the provision of intelligence, are all greatly reduced on their side of the house. And now, the alternative is working with the cartel as opposed to the United States. But second, and the more insidious impact that comes as a result of this, is as follows. Now the U.S. is more likely to take unilateral actions to deal with the remaining monopoly cartel. But quickly closing. Can you get me explain to you why there's a choice to work with the U.S. or the cartel? Like, I feel like Mexico can work with both, which actually is going to happen. I just explained to you, the argument is not Mexico's choice, it's the United States' choice. The U.S. is literally under USMCA right now trying to designate Mexican drug cartels as terrorist organizations. Under that policy, your advocacy literally turns Mexico into a state sponsor of terrorism. If this is the case, America is not going to provide intelligence and aid to a government that is aiding and abetting the number one purveyor of drugs into its country. Instead, America says if there is going to be this one monopoly cartel, and Mexico is going to do nothing about it, and we will take matters into our own hands, and we will attack them on their own. This means that the U.S. goes against this monopoly cartel on its own, which creates more flashpoints of violence between the United States and its forces and the forces of this monopoly cartel. The reason why this is worse than the comparative is because the U.S. has less knowledge of the facts on the ground than if it was working with the Mexican government and actually gaining local intelligence than it was working with Mexico on firstly. But secondly, America has less of a regard for what actually happens in Mexico. Because again, America's goal is not to mitigate violence at the local level or create state legitimacy. It's just to stop the flow of drugs into the United States. So on this argument, all of the impacts that they get to you get worse because there's still going to be a war fought against every single cartel in Mexico. America just picks up the slack that Mexico creates. But with the monopoly cartel, there's going to be more violence. There's less likely that we can actually mitigate violence through cooperation. And they are more emboldened to engage in the kind of things that create a destructive society. We are proud to oppose. Here, here. Like, you should create a society that people want to live in. 
And implicitly they have the idea that like people will value their government not working with the cartel above their fundamental needs, which is like the need for safety and not being shot and not living in fear of your life, right? We fundamentally reject that premise and we think that people on the ground can live with the government entering into an agreement with the cartel if it means a safer society. This is the first and the secondary need. Secondly, they talk about how this will place the cartel in, um, in charge and this will be like an undemocratically elected government essentially because they provide so many services. And here is where we provide a unique characterization of what cartels in Mexico actually look like, right? Right now, we have cartels that are local monopolies. This means that they enjoy the same level of power and all of the harms that were presented on the opposition side just on a smaller scale. Except, in addition to that, there is violence between cartels as they seek to gain more market share, which is the fundamental incentive of cartels, it is to make money. So all of the harms they bring to you, they have. And second, uh, in addition to that, they have more violence, way right? between the cartels, and they can clearly take that on the government side, right? So they also talk about this idea of like when a cartel dies, there's political dependency. We think that this is just kind of an unsubstantiated argument about why more people are going to die on our side. We don't really see the clear reason. But um, lastly, they talk about how there is no incentive for uh, the cartels to actually decrease deaths. We're going to deal with that in our substantive. Um, and the rest of deputy leader's uh, points will be covered in my substantive. So firstly, what is the cartel's incentive structure? Right? This is a unique explanation of the mechanism that we're going to give you in closing this government. So the incentive structure of the cartel is actually to make money. They form a way for people to achieve economic upliftment, right? People don't want to grow up and work for a cartel. They only do it because the cartel is able to provide economic opportunity that is not otherwise available. How does the cartel actually do that? It needs to gain market share. It needs to gain either trade routes to other countries to seek out their consumers, or they need to have more domestic territory. This is the link that we don't hear from government side so far, which is that they want profit, right? So this strategic violence isn't just violence for fun, which I think like, it is a mischaracterization of opposition side. They think like, even if you sign a deal with the government, you're still going to enact a lot of violence. But what is going to be the purpose of that violence when you are not fighting someone for market share? People don't just kill for fun, right? Right now, we think the characterization of the violence is often like when you want to take out another cartel's um, leader, right? But you don't necessarily have a lot of resources. So the only thing that you can do is to just go in there and have a lot of collateral damage, take that risk in order to achieve your objectives, right? We say that in a world where that doesn't exist, the cartels will be much less violent if at all. And the long-term comparative is you have the growth of one um, cartel, maybe other people from other cartels, like the other cartels start to abandon themselves, and we think that in the long term, the impact is that your competition in the market is actually fundamentally different, right? We think that in the current situation, because the cartel wants to grow and wants to have more and more profit, you have a lot of competition in the domestic market where they're going to cut, um, undercut each other's prices, where they're going to sell all sorts of products and uh, even um, increase addiction and like sell new products to new people because they want to gain market share. We say that uniquely in the case where one cartel has control over the entire country and has that market share, they are less driven to do this. And we say that on the comparative, even though a cartel is going to be profit driven on either side, we say that at a point at which they have reached the limits of their territorial expansion, they are going to be much less damaging in their action. Um, they also, so um, this is the more, so the second argument is like why are they going to be more cooperative in the long run? We think that there is a natural incentive between cartels and governments to actually work together because the process of eliminating other cartels is going to take time. This means that you're going to have a period of several years where the cartel and the government are actively working together. You probably have people from leadership in government and leadership in the cartel sitting down to discuss things, or um, even if that's not the case, there's an acknowledgement of a mutual reliance. What this means is the cartel is incentivized not to actually take strong action against the government because they've been through this period of mutual bonding and togetherness, right? This relies on the nature of humans to actually work together for the mutual benefit. Um, and secondly, because of this increase in cooperation, the government is more likely to be able to have an influence on the activities that they can engage in. Again, I talked about like, why the cartels engage in the things they do. Like, why do you do really dangerous things, such as trafficking or dealing with the most dangerous drugs, when you can make profit in an easier way? So we actually think the number of serious crimes is going to decrease on the government side. Lastly, we're going to talk about the impact on women and children, who we think are the most vulnerable stakeholders in this debate, right? Because right now, it, it is when primarily men enter into cartels, it's the women and children who are caught in the crossfire. They're the ones who, if um, a, a male family member or the breadwinner of their family actually 
actually dies, they're the ones who are left without economic opportunity. We think that the current way that the government fight, um, endorsing like fighting for three health health is especially damaging and isolating to women and children. When we want, I'll take clothing if they have anything. Okay, so if you have waited for a market share, if a firm could be more profitable and could do less risky behavior, would it be just better strictly on our side costs and just more profitable? If a firm could be more profitable and has more market share, I, I look, as I explained before, we think that the profit incentives are limited on our side of the house. I'll move on to my second item about why the US will continue to grow with Mexico, right? First of all, the US shares of with Mexico, that's never going to change. They have a vested interest in actually controlling the amount of drugs that enter their um, borders. They're not just going to pull out of Mexico. Secondly, the US has already poured millions of dollars in and it has not worked. We think that in this case, the US is open to a change in strategy because it knows it doesn't have any other option. And lastly, this like presumption on the opposition side that the US is somehow going to enter into Mexico themselves and fight this war. We said that this is never going to happen because the US has learned from experiences in Vietnam that it hates guerrilla warfare and that it does not do well in guerrilla warfare, which is what we think this current cartel climate represents, right? Secondly, the US is not going to go to war with a country that exists on its borders because it risks the um, possibility that this violence will actually spill into their own borders. We think that because of these unchangeable factors, we've offered you the unique analysis of why the US will always have a vested interest, and for all those reasons weighing how we have less violence on our side, how they have all harms the monopoly on the opposition side, anyway, very proud to propose. <laughs> even screen, like, screen over the government itself, and why the counterfactual is that the, the war on drugs in Mexico is likely to get much, much better if we do not. But first of all, let's establish the aim of the Mexican government, because it seems that the Mexican government is in favor of cartels, which is not given the analysis and of, like, the broad observation of opposition, which was given. The, the main aim of the Mexican government is to restore the control of the territory that will ensure stability that is the stability for economic growth, the stability that enables to attract investors who are not scared of their territory, of their investment like share being caught by the cartel, that enables people who choose for themselves not to have jobs just as a cartel where you can be murdered after they have arrived to the cartel but have the way to have the better future. The second thing, it's a very important thing, is why cartel is never going to be aligned with government in the long run. Because it seems bizarre. The idea of the cartel, which will be monopolized, is to take as much power as it possible. The only body, if you wipe out all other cartels, is going to be the government. So the Mexican government is the only problem for this big cartel to have the exclusive power over the territory. Given that it has incentive to push down the government, it will do it. How mechanistically it will do it? First of all, the currently corrupt officials, that means it's not just the corrupt officials, that means that the police and the vast majority of Mexican states actually controlled by uh, cartels, and it is going to be much worse on their side because they are likely to pour the vast majority of money. It is like special agency, intelligence forces who gather information, now will gather information in the favor of the cartel because the cartel has the power to corrupt them. The second thing is the control over the territory. The vast majority of people will be going to, it's going to be under this cartel. That means that the vast majority of GDP, the vast majority of labor force, is now going to be poured into gathering money and earning money precisely for the cartel. That means that the economic power of the cartel, in terms of buying weapons, bribing officials, buying some stuff that allows him to, for example, uh, create an intelligence over the, uh, of the government is going to be harder. The third thing is 
is the ability of control the public opinion. The cartels actually control opinion by providing services, by providing, for example, church services and religion. That means at the point at the point at which you control government like the opinions of people, they are likely to use that opinion against any government who tries to create a little of pushback against them. That means that the power the cartels are likely to cement is going to be immense, given that the body currently is corrupt and it is going to be corrupt. There is no power in the ability to get it. Even if they say it is going to be aligned for seven years, after seven years the cartel took the power, they are likely to like create a disalignment and actually push back the government. Why it is deteriorating for the government? And I will explain. So, first thing. The problem that exists is follows. Like, why is the deteriorating? First of all, it is much like it is much worse ability of government to support actually the drug trafficking because it seems that it, because it is very important. It is very important you prevent cartels of conquering the territory. You prevent cartels of murdering people. You prevent cartels of taking the power. The first thing why this will be important because they currently don't have. Like the, the, the cartels are likely to have the vast majority of money poured into controlling police, controlling intelligence, because like the first thing you need to, if you want to cement the power, the first thing you need to control is to control, like military, is to control the police. You are left, the government has less forces to control those things. That means you have less forces to prevent murderous activity of the, like murderous activity of the cartels. You are less likely to control uh, human trafficking, uh, prost the illegal prosecution, children selling, that what occurs in Mexico currently, and that is one of the main profits of the Mexican cartels currently. The second thing is that now uh, the cartels are likely to have much more complicated structure. If it's a big monopoly, you're likely to have different fat farmers across the world, uh, across, across the Mexico, different farmers, uh, uh, di uh, different storages. Why is it important? The comparative on their side is the one control in south of Mexico, essentially, that like, controls farming. Another one cartel controls shipments, so it is the chain of different cartels, and they are very vulnerable because they rely on their own trust. But if you give the power to the one cartel, that means he cements all of those chains, and you cannot specifically tackle one cartel, destroying the whole chain in like all in all. Secondly, in observation in terms of international support, like the billions, like the half of the budget of Mexico that have worked in order to combat all those things is actually from the United States, from other countries. It is going to be evaporate every time because you know the Donald Trump will never pay money to the government that gives that money to murderers. It is very bad for him if he will certainly stop it. But this money goes not only to combat the cartels, but also to have poor people recover from the cartel assistance, to provide investments that are going to tackle those things and like actually attract people on government side and uh, out of the cartel uh, things. The first, the, the fifth thing is the observation in terms of Mexican citizens. What I'm going to say is this. The currently what situation exists is that currently cartels don't have violence. Why do they don't have violence? Because first of all, they rely on chain, as I explained, they have violence like destroys all their chains. Secondly, because the murder murdering is actually like makes their business worse. I think the opening of opposition established it perfectly. Why the problem will occur? On their side, the first seven years are likely to have to, to, to happen is likely to be the seven year, like the terror years of war, because another cartels are likely to push back against. And the, the, the only government can sense that cartels are very powerful. That means the resistance is going to be very powerful. That means that they are going to be murderous citizens, and for seven years, Mexico will be covered with the blood. Secondly, even if it, like, when seven years stop, what is likely to happen is that the incentive of the cartel to cater about people evaporate. Because on our side, different cartels care about the people, so the people never go to another cartel. On their side, the benefits will stop. You will never provide public services, you will never create schools, you will never create a betterment for the society. The third thing is you never get able to combat the cartel because on our side you have different small cartels that you can tackle. They're like 10 times less powerful, 10 times vulnerable. On our side, on their side you have a body which is unable to be combated. All those reasons are proud.
today boils down to three questions. First, do cartels use violence for anything else more importantly than territorial warfare? We say no. Secondly, will there be long-term decrease in violence without this motion? We say no. And thirdly, will the U.S. suddenly help suddenly stop cooperating with Mexico because of this motion? We say absolutely not. Before going on to talk about these three clash points, a quick line of clarification is that the most important key metric in this debate is which side decreases the amount of violence that is happening as a result of the cartels in Mexico, especially in the long run. And I think the long run compared to this, especially what has been missing in the upper house of the debate, it will be uniquely provided to a TG extension. Moving on to the first uh, clash point. So what, what, what exactly is the problem in the status quo? Why do cartels use violence? So what you're looking aside open opposition is two things. So one thing about like how cartels are fighting at international level, they're fighting at international cartels and borders, and secondly, about how they're doing human like trafficking and killing people is so key. We think that the, especially the first characterization is simply just misunderstanding of the facts of the world as it is. Cartels in Mexico are incredibly regional. They hold strong regional monopolies, not international level fights where they're like fighting different cartels in Colombia or fighting different like drug trafficking agencies in the United States. We think that the problem right now in the status quo is that there are many cartels vying for market share within Mexico domestic. So I think this is just a factual misunderstanding of the case from the closed side of the open opposition. Cartels aren't counter violence internationally, it's domestic violence. Secondly, why is the uh, violence right now so brutal? Because the territorial warfare is so brutal because the cartels are so evenly matched up. This is a key reason of us tying back why the long term the outside can have no sovereignty at all. Because, it's, because of so many cartels are so evenly matched up, there is no one dominant cartel they can actually have convergence. This kind of violence and violent for partnership is going to happen indefinitely in their side of the world in the long run, especially. So we think that this is a key misunderstanding on the outside of what, how, what is the cartel incentive structure if you're using violence. What do we tell you uniquely from the side opposing government? We tell you that the the reason why cartels use violence isn't just indiscriminately. To quote uh, the, the deputy leader of uh, the leader of opposition, they say that the point which the cartels are monopoly, they're just going to start like, killing and discriminating, like, going on a like, killing rampage. We tell you this is not how cartels employ violence. We think we, we actually tell you that cartels use violence, cartels use violence very strategically, only in like, things like, like, like targeted killings, but especially the biggest amount of violence and the biggest amount of especially civilian casualties that happen is because of territorial warfare, the key power in the status quo that has been missed by the opening of uh, the entirety of the opposition bench. So how do we distinguish ourselves from the or, or more opening in terms of territorial warfare? Because that was brought up in the opening of our government case. We, we give you the long-term comparison because the opening government never told you why it's like the, the, the lack of a territorial warfare would actually lead to long-term solvency. We, we tell you instead in our extension that at the point in which they don't have to buy for market share anymore, they're going to get rid of the most important cause of civilian deaths, i.e. territorial warfare. Therefore, we're, we're, we're winning on the key metric of why there's actually going to be increased violence in the long run. Which leads me, oh, uh, there was a second uh, clash point about the long-term decrease in violence. Let me again go about the opposition case group. So the opposition picture was something like this, especially in opening up, they told you that, the, uh, that right now, with the monopoly, there will be increase in violence. Why? The reason was that they're going to have no checks, therefore they're going to increase at killings, they're, going to, they're not going to be like, held accountable. And the second thing that I think it was a bit weird was that right now in the status quo, they said people can turn to other cartels so that the cartels aren't going to be as violent to the people. I think this is just completely untrue because people don't have a choice about what cartels to turn to, what allegiances to have, because cartels in the status quo have local monopoly. So it's not like oh, someone living under the uh, rule of the sin of cartel can be like, oh no, you can't kill me or my family because I'm going to report to a different cartel. But it's just not how like, people have agency in the status quo. Therefore, like the kind of restriction of violence in, this, in the status quo that like, the open opposition talks about is simply just factually incorrect. Well, for, what do we tell you instead of getting the long term comparison? We tell you that at the point in which you have a monopoly, it is much less likely for the kind of territorial warfare which you identify as so problematic to happen. And again, this brings us into a comparison. Right? So, everyone's goal, of course, is to have a decrease in violence and decrease in session, civilian casualty, uh, resulting from cartel, like, you know, inf uh, cartels. But then, what is the solvency on opening by, on the opposition side? I'm really confused. Like, are these like, hundreds of thousands of cartels in Mexico suddenly going to all disappear? Because they tell you, oh, the end goal is for Mexicans to live in a, in a, in a country that they want to live in. So how are these, all these hundreds of cartels going to suddenly magically disappear? So the point is they don't require a counter-proposal or, or an alternative solution of how there can be actual meaningful decrease in violence. We think the convergence of one cartel is actually going to provide a meaningful difference in violence because of the, uh, because of the lack of territory in playing a key piece of characterization in our long-term comparative that is, opening in our, that is missing in our opening path. Furthermore, 
we tell you, oh, really quick, sorry, sorry. Before the moving on to my third question about the US as a stakeholder, really quick exchange with Bottle about the extension coming up and closing. They said that Cartel is currently a different structure, they're currently uh, interdependent, they're going to become stronger, and there's a monopoly. I think this is just packing on two cartels. As I told you before, where global monopolies, they have, they're like interdependent on each other for like trade, like producing drugs. I think cartels are in, like, internally consistent already. So if cartels don't work with each other, the whole like, the extension doesn't really work. Moving on to the third class point about the United States inside the structure, right? So what do we hear from the closing? The closing basically just like talk, talk about like how Trump will not get money, which is pretty derivative of the opening opposition, talking about how they, like one point about how the US is going to intervene unilaterally, but also about like how Mexico will be like a state sponsor of areas and the US will start working. I'll take over. Accepting your premise that the goal of these cartels is market share. The market for these cartels is not in other parts of Mexico, it's in the US and South America, which is why almost all of the violence happens at the border of the top half and the bottom half of the country. Why is regional violence more important than these border clashes, which gets worse than the monopoly in the Because, still, the violence comes from competition for market share. At the point at which there is monopoly, there is no competition, less violence. I think that's a very intuitive, straightforward logical belief that I think. Okay, we're going to tell the US class. So, but then I think the US, they, they misunderstand the uh, political incentive of the US because from the perspective of the United States, they would prefer to negotiate with a monopoly rather than hundreds of different cartels. Why is the case? Because it's easier to strike agreements with leaders of one organization rather than trying to strike an overall agreement with 50 different cartels, which isn't the status quo. The status quo is this there are hundreds of cartels existing in the mid Mexico right now. The US has tried the policy of war on drugs and it has failed miserably. Why? Especially because the US isn't able to meaningfully negotiate with all these different cartels. So, even from the Perspective of the United States. They're more likely to prefer a world in which Mexico actually supports having one preference to one monopoly of one huge cartel. So the US can have meaningful political negotiations, which hints their burden of like US wanting to have decrease in flow of jobs or having more meaningful negotiations. So we think the US isn't going to suddenly stop the relationship. I think it will be in the US best interest to actually continue working with the Mexico, especially at the point which they have a bridge to a monopoly or a cartel. For these three reasons, so proud to stand outside closing government. The Mexican government hasn't been able to defeat the cartels literally for centuries, but the government team in this debate proposes to give an enormous amount of power to one single small cartel that it is able to foster sort of public fortify its missions, and then somehow, they assume that that cartel is going to break from the government. We don't, don't think that that is what is going to happen. Three questions that I'm going to ask for my speech is so first of all, clar clarify how specifically the status quo looks like. Secondly, explain to you why we are going to have more violence in the short term, and thirdly, explain to you why the uh, incentives of the um, of the cartel is not the contrary to those of the government, right? Before that, uh, yeah, so, so first of all, on the status quo, so we hear from opening government, uh, and like closing government, that the reason there is violence in the status quo is because cartels compete for territory, and then we hear like the lack of, and then we hear a similar claim of course achievements as a bigger thing for market share, which to me sounds exactly like competing for territory, and like, you know, the southern stuff to people, so it doesn't sound like an exception to me, right? We tell you that this is, uh, we tell you that this is not true to the status quo. Why? Because we tell you that in, uh, in the status quo, it is much more profitable profitable to you for you to sell your zones of influence that, the, that you don't uh, like with other cartels that you don't like. There is more this because violence you know, the violence with cartels causes a lot of harms to you, right? So those are harms to the, like, like first of all, you're not sure if you're going to specifically win a certain battle, you might you might lose a lot of resources. It is specifically more profitable for you to negotiate that there is a certain stability and safety of your zones for a long period of time rather than uncertainty and like possibility of facts, right? They tell you that like big market shares. We tell that Mexico is a rather small country, right? It is much more profitable for those uh, for those specific cartels to negotiate their 
or zones of influence, uh, so zones of influence with them, then they can be more, uh, more market shares outside in other countries when they export those goods. And that is much more profitable because the cost of this is much higher and then the benefit, which is the market share, is much larger. That's why on the level of incentives, we think that we are about both teams because we expect to be like how on the incentives level this is beneficial. But secondly, we tell you that the cartel is much easier for both the cartels are much more profitable to, in, to insert themselves in certain chains of production in order to be able to sort of lose amount of resources and to be able to get the best return, right? So when one can talk to the producers across the other exports, there is a that enables them to specifically specialize on one thing rather than specializing in many things there, or it's very small resources, but the profits are still very large, right? That is the incentive why cartels have them to go to copyright rather than like unabashedly fight with one and one another. We don't hear any response from the government to that by the CG is also losing, right? So we tell you that therefore, in the status quo, we don't have much violence uh, on this part. Now, we think that all, all touches on this, but we never explain to you on the level of incentives why that is specifically the case. That is the extent, extension of my part. Now, moving on to the second question, why are we going to have more violence than in the status quo on their side? We tell you that uh, on their side of the house, they're given a specific like, Cartels are simply not going to agree with this policy, right? And I know that OO didn't touch on this, but it's like we opening not government, no government teams ever bothered to prove to you why this policy is going to be effective. We tell you that in, in the status quo, cartels are so interested as the as, as government wants you to believe in their territory, their problem that that incentive is going to remain under their side as well. So what is their incentive to peacefully give up their lands? We tell you that there is none. The, the, we tell you that they're going to be incentivized to backlash against the government. They're going to be incentivized to backlash against that, that one monopolist cartel. So what, why exactly? Because again, this is like the only profit that those cartels have is specifically important for them to keep the control of resources. I don't think government ever disputes that, right? We think that the government and other cartels won't be able to successfully uh, take down those other cartels for a couple of reasons. Right? First of all, we think that there is going to be always collateral damage as a result of those actions, right? So when you also as a government are like attacking cartels that also control large portions of the population who live there or who can tend to live there because they get economic benefits, right? You're going to specifically harm those individuals, which as government tells you like the government doesn't want to, right? But secondly, there's always and like there's going to be an incentive when you part of those cartels to, re to retaliate against any kind of military intervention by the government or by other cartels. The most useful tactic that many small small military groups use around the world is indirect warfare, which looks like terrorist attacks on large cities in Mexico, which specifically harm to individuals who have never consented to be harmed and they specifically harm for, for, for the government. And that, that's why it is going to be a large pushback from the population of Mexico so that the government stops supporting that monopoly. And that's why this policy is never going to be effective, right? I think that the impact of this is that we're going to have a large proportion of violence in the short term. We lose so large numbers of deaths to people, which means that there's going to be to be less control of the government, there's going to be more energy. And also, there's going to be a lot of little lost opportunities because the government has wasted that money in some number, as opposed to, for example, improving the well-being of individuals who live within that country, which I think is very well in the incentive, right? We think that that is a very important clash in this debate because we tell you that on the measure that both government teams propose, which is lives of people and violence, we are definitely winning. Secondly, uh, moving on to the second question, why do you think that state is going to be oh, uh, not the second question, but why do we think state is most preferable? First of all, I explain to you that there is little to no violence or incentive to commit violence based on the incentive the government gives you. But secondly, in terms of choice, which is a response to the CG, we, we tell you that first of all, there is an incentive on the part of cartels to provide benefits to the people within them, specifically because there is competition between cartels and people can choose to go to like, work for another cartel if one cartel is specifically abusive. So that's why we think it is totally fine. Final question of, of this debate, why do you think this monopoly, even if successful in your own term, is going to have contrary interests to, the, the, to what the government says? OO simply asserts that, uh, like tells you that the, the cartel is going to be more powerful with time. We tell you that they don't explain to you what is their incentive not to cooperate with government, especially if they're getting benefits from government. We tell you two things. First of all, even if a CG tells you the cartel it has an incentive to cooperate with government, we tell you that those incentives are short term, right? So I, as a member, like as a, an owner of cartel, care about profits. If it is my incentive to cooperate in the short term, in the long term, but it's no longer profitable, I'm not going to cooperate. Specifically, because I don't need to be. Because I'm the monopoly cartel, I have the most resources and the most power, right? Like, we don't think that they're going to bond, we think that that is simply preposterous, right? So, what are the of incentives? The cartel you will always want to have to export more and more drugs abroad. They will always want to have more resources in order to maximize their profits because that's what they care about. Mexico, specifically, is not incentivized to support that because it's going to have more international sanctions or simply like Europe aid because it's failing to, to, to come. 
political terms, and that's why it has a specific incentive as the government to regulate the monopoly of, the, of that cartel, but it will not have resources, enough resources to do this, because if it can defeat all the cartels in the status quo, it certainly won't be able to defeat the single most powerful cartel that has ever existed in Mexico. We talk about that in Naples, it, 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 this policy is Naples, and essentially the creation, creation of a specifically harmful cartel that is going to have, as my partner, Benito explained to you, a very complex structure that is going to make, to like make it very hard for Mexico to ever fight in the future, which means that the human rights abuses are going to worsen because there is no motivation, there is no incentive on the part of you to ever provide benefits to people who continue to abuse them. We think that on that, because of that, we prove to you that there are significant harms both in short term and long term, both closing up.